Okay, we're good. All right. So I'll call the November 10th, 2020 work study session to order. Um, the time is 4.31 and first in our agenda is superintendent check-in. I was muted, sorry about that. All right, thank you. Uh, I actually just have two items. I'm actually gonna let, if we could let, Josh is gonna be contributing to one of my two items. So Josh, if you're okay with it, I'm gonna have you just go first because I think yours might be a little bit shorter. Yep, we'll do. We're gonna begin talking about the boundary changes, the fun boundary changes coming up ahead of us. So I'll let Josh take it away. Great, well, Chair Yenner, directors of the board, thank you all for the opportunity. I'm gonna walk through with you some information about our upcoming boundary change work. Uh, and we will be asking you to take action on a couple items here at the end of the month at our November 24th board meeting. Uh, the first item that we wanna talk about tonight is uh, developing and adopting some guiding principles for our boundary change conversations. Um, and as you can see here, um, we want these uh, guiding principles to um, impact the greatest number of families that we possibly can in our district. Uh, we understand that all eight of these principles might not be obtainable for everyone, uh, but we're committing to have a transparent and very public process as we go through these boundary change conversations. And you can see that we have eight items here listed. Uh, number one, our boundaries will largely be contiguous, which means they'll touch. Um, we want to make sure that we're balancing our socioeconomic status, balancing our, our school communities of color and our spoken languages. Uh, we'd like to make sure that we can develop boundaries that are going to last for a long period of time but we know that we might need to be flexible and nimble based on our district demographic and housing trends. We wanna limit our time on the school bus for elementary kids to 30 minutes to the extent possible. Uh, we will commit to keeping our walking distances to a half a mile for our elementary school students. Uh, we'd like our open enrolled students to move schools with their cohorts to the extent possible. And then we will follow our process that we currently have or our procedure um, for our interdistrict transfers. And so we're going to be asking the board to adopt these guiding principles at the end of this month at our November 24th business meeting, uh, which means that we're going to be sticking to committing to these eight items as we go through our boundary change conversations. Uh, the next item that we're going to we're going to ask you to adopt is our committee charge. We're going to form a committee uh, that will be developed that will consist of members from our community, uh, parents, community members, and students that will be led by our district and building admin teams. Um, and we'd like the committee charge to be to develop new 622 boundaries that will be implemented in the fall of 2022. Uh, the committee will use the school board's guiding principles. We'll commit to sticking to our mission statement and we'll use the expertise of our leadership team to provide the foundation for our school boundaries. Um, if a committee member would like to be part of our committee, they need to commit to strive to create equitable boundaries that will create learning environments that are equitable and that will serve our community for um, now and into the future and will efficiently utilize our district resources. And then again, you can see that we're gonna have uh, our committee members made up of parents, community members, students, again, led by our district admin and building leadership teams. And we do have a draft timeline as well uh, that we uh, are going to present to you tonight. And so tonight we're talking about our guiding principles. Uh, we're gonna review this timeline and the committee charge. Again, on November 24th, we're gonna ask you to vote on the guiding principles and the boundary um, committee charge. And then we have some updates along the way. So we're gonna update the board uh, during work sessions and business meetings. Um, and you can see that we are going to begin conversations with our committee actually in February. And we're gonna to commit to doing uh, weekly or bi-weekly meetings with this committee. Uh, some topics that we'll discuss will be uh, facilities, transportation. We'll talk about our city demographics and possible growth areas. We're gonna invite folks in from different departments to talk about our educational programs, our special ed programs. And then we're gonna get into some work with our Guide K-12 program, which is actually the boundary change software that we're using. And we'll be breaking off and doing some work in these small groups. And we'll come back and have some large group discussions. And then you can see uh, even on to the spring, we'll continue to update the board at our March study sessions and business meetings. 
And then we are committing to um, have a final recommendation to you all in April or May to take final action on at either the April or May business meeting, um, which will be the recommendation for our new boundaries that we'll then share with the public um, either late, late next spring or early summer. Uh, and just one note that this is a draft timeline as of this point in time, uh, where we stand right now. Um, and then if any changes would come up, we would definitely inform the board um, if any changes were to come up. And so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm really excited about this plan. So I can't wait to see where it takes us. Um, yeah, thanks for sliding back up to that slide. Um, what, uh, besides you, Josh, who else is kind of on the core team so far? Or who are you working with so far? So it'll be uh, Jenna Peters, who is our principal on special assignment for facilities. And Jenna cool. has been in the district for a long time. Uh, Troy Miller, our assistant superintendent. And then we're also working with a consultant on the back end to do some work within Guide K-12. And so we, ha we have an outside person that we're working with as well to help, de to help develop our scenario. Awesome. And will there be like, um, as far as uh, item number two there and item number three, um, what kind of experts will we have on, on, on the team that we can use to help with those two items? Yeah, so we're gonna rely on our, our internal teams to do that. So we're gonna be inviting folks from, from teaching and learning, from transportation, from our business office to all come um, awesome. and share information with the committee. And so the, the, when we form the committee, they will be, um, we, we want the committee to learn all the ins and outs to these um, issues um, during those meetings. And so um, we will invite our, our experts to come into the weekly or bi-weekly meetings with our committee started in February to really discuss these topics. If I could add to that as well, Josh, um, one of the things that we are, you know, a, a grounding piece that started uh, some of our initial planning is that uh, demography study that was done by Hazel Reinhardt. You all had a presentation from her earlier this year. Um, that That's a good grounding piece of data mm -hmm. for us as far as neighborhoods, school boundaries and whatnot. She's got a lot of details in there that will be referenced quite a bit. Um, and then Guide K-12 is, is this software program that actually pulls data right out of our student uh, information database, which is Infinite Campus. So when we talk about looking at languages spoken, demographics, and what have you, Guide K-12 is a program that allows you to try out different boundaries and actually see what the impact is if you were hypothetical boundaries and see what would happen demographically at a click of a button, you can really see because it's tied to all of our student database with demographic um, markers. So it, it allows you to take a look at, um, at different possibilities and looking at how well does it keep our schools integrated um, and, and you know heterogeneous as we want them to be. One of the things, and um, you may recall, and I, I wanna bring this back again as well. When we looked at some of the issues, I like that Josh mentioned, they would be contiguous boundaries because when you hear and learn about what are gerrymandered boundaries, they're not contiguous. It's the opposite of that. They're basically drawn around high poverty housing complexes. And you know, there's a lot of othering that happens in decision makings when there are political appointees to these kinds of committees. Um, one of the things that Josh and I have also talked about, and, and I, I'm glad you mentioned Jenna too, because I really want Jenna to be a key leader in this as well. These boundaries will largely affect elementary schools, not middles and highs, right? Because at this point in the game, although we do want to look at the middle and high boundaries, at this point, we're definitely leaning towards keeping the boundaries of Tartan and North as they are, and then the two middles would line right into those. So that, that would be less of a, a debate discussion. It really is going to be an elementary conversation on, on many levels. And so um, not only is Jenna in charge of our facilities, work. She's our POSA, our principal and special assignment supervising and liaisoning between schools and architects and constructions firms. But she also has a lot of that history. Um, and, and as a long time elementary principal has some of the history of kind of how things have been divided up in the past. And additionally, we, Troy and Josh and I and Jenna have talked about how uh, we'd really like to kind of tap into particularly our elementary principals who are going to be displaced by their school buildings closing because they're very neutral in, the, in, this, in this picture, right? Because boundaries will be decided 
before we finalize which principals are going to be finally over which schools in the end of all this. And the fact that our principals um, in the schools that are closing, Oakdale, Skyview Elementary, and Webster in particular, they have a lens of looking at this through where their students are going to land, what sh and they and without having a personal bias, perhaps not that ours would exercise any bias, but you know, even a perceived bias because they're not going to be attached to any of the new particular boundaries that, that yet. So we thought they would be a really great um, resource to help us as well in sort of leading some of this effort. Great work. Um, like I said, I'm really excited for this um, to kind of work through some of the ant antiquated borders that we have right now. And, um, and racist borders, I would add, quite yeah. frankly. Um, also, <clears throat> I know like some of the elementary schools are, uh, have more students than others. How, which, how does that kind of play in or does it tap into kind of all those guidance areas that we were looking at before? Um, just a just weaver off the top of my head. Um, I know has a, a large population. Um, do, is, is there a goal in there as well? Or is it kind of mixed in with all the other goals to just make sure that all the schools are kind of balanced out as far as population size? That's our goal is to balance out as best as we can all of our Sweet. population size. Absolutely. Great work. Part of the reason Weaver has gotten to where it is, is, and actually quite honestly, several other schools are under enrolled and others are, you know, completely over, over capacity is because we haven't done one of these in a really long time. And school districts everywhere have to periodically modify your adjustment, adjust your boundaries based on population densities as they shift and move between neighborhoods. And when you go too long without adjusting them, you get in situations like we're in with Weaver. And then likewise, under enrollment of some schools that had more capacity. So that, that'll be a big piece of it too. Josh, I, uh, I had a question. I live in the Webster district and um, when my neighbors um, ask me, you know, why this change is going to happen, um, I, I basically talk about Webster being racially isolated and then I talk about the improvements at Richardson. I don't know, I'm kind of fumbling the messaging on this, I think, with them. Um, I mean, you know, their, their families, as we will hear over and over for the next year or so, I mean, they're disappointed they won't be walking their kids to school. Um, so anyway, what, what can we say relative to the messaging about, about uh, Webster uh, and, and I guess, uh, Oakdale and Skyview Elementary too. I think one of the biggest things and, and other folks can add into this conversation also is, is that, you know, this whole facilities process is about designing equitable and beautiful learning environments for all of our elementary students. Mm -hmm. and, and that is for, for our Webster families, our Oakdale families, our Skyview families, all of our families will, um, when, when, this, when this entire facilities project is done, they will be in top notch facilities environments that they're not in right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. I would just add, we're consolidating from nine elementaries to seven. And so I get that there's going to be some schools that are going to have to be, and there was a whole lot of studies done about which sites were the best to expand and build upon and which ones were not. And so I would just add that um, it's part of an overall transition that all students, even in current, even if their school isn't closing, many will face changes to their school assignments just because we're redrawing the boundaries for the whole district, not just for Webster. I think that's a really key message to share that it's, it's a redrawing of boundaries for everybody okay. so that everybody can have a beautiful top-notch environment. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, and then relative to class size, I know, <clears throat> I think at Webster they, they've been smaller, for example. Um, so, um, what say we about about uh, changes in class size? Our goal is going to also be to try to even out class sizes. There will be no perfect answer. Um, class sizes at Webster being smaller um, have to do with the enrollment being low there. And I think um, whenever you have real discrepancies across the district between some really high class numbers and lower ones, that's a sign of inefficiencies in the system where the system isn't right sized. So I think evening it out 
um, with the idea that nobody should have to, it, you know, with a low class size at Webster shouldn't result in a super high class size at another school, part of the boundary adjustments will help even that out. Um, and, and we do have on average lower class sizes than many neighboring districts and we're proud of that and wanna maintain that as an average as well. And then relative to uh, families that may have enjoyed walking and now will be busing, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's, uh, that, that's a big change for people, you know? Mm -hmm. All over the district it will be, because mm -hmm. there will be some who walk now who will be bused. Mm -hmm. But I will say part of our ground, uh, part of our guidelines is to try to maintain short bus routes, not put people on long bus routes. And mm -hmm. so I'm, we're really hopeful that that we can stick to that. Another thing we're really aiming to stick with, which many districts do not have anymore, is less than half mile distances to bus stops. Uh, mm -hmm. Many districts have gone to one mile um, to, away from bus stops. And we have, we've really, we just had a meeting last week about trying to really maintain that because I think, um, especially when we are in higher poverty environments, we're less likely to have uh, parents who maybe can walk their kids to school because they are also working and don't always have the luxury of that. And so I think we have to have the safest walks to school and bus routes as we possibly can. I mean, it's, it's heartening to talk about <clears throat> a more normal situation where kids yes. are going to school again in person. Um, but uh, relative to busing and bus stop, well, we have a bus stop committee. I know <laughs> sometimes um, parents want some input on um, bus stops and that gets to be kind of a big deal. Is there a, a committee that'll be looking at, you know, assigning bus stops in a sensible way? That's done by transportation, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I really would, um, I think people who, that the idea of busing distances and what have you mm -hmm. make a lot of sense to, um, to connect with this boundary study committee. I would say though that there's a lot of people who, um, when you start asking about uh, where somebody's bus stop should be. One person wants it changed down a block, but the person down the block doesn't want it changed up the block. And I, there's some really clear guiding principles we have about that, and we probably should just communicate and publicize them. We try to put uh, bus stops at the places where there's the most number of kids to, to pick up in a stop. There's certain rules about which side of the street we have to be on if we want to avoid hazardous crossings. Um, I certainly would say what we could do is um, perhaps create an appeals process uh, that could be submitted if somebody really felt frustrated about their bus stop. But uh, I would have a hard time putting that to a, a group of parents to be debating because they would all be in competition with each other too often. I've seen really, really ugly situations over bus stop changes. When you don't follow guiding principles about your bus stops, then things get really, really wonky. No guiding principles are good and, and communication is essential. Yes. I just been on the board a long time and Kim knows this. I mean, when we used to yep. have this, you know, public comment, very robust public comment. I mean, so many of the comments were about bus stops. <laughs> yep, they often are. And, um, you know, and some, you know, legitimate concerns and then some just, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not so much, but, uh, but at any rate, it, it'd be good to have, um, you know, uh, to lay out for folks how these decisions are made and if there's an appeals process and so on. So. That's true. And having an appeals process, I would, I would say we haven't had a lot of complaints about bus stops lately because mm -hmm. people do call us about them and we do go look at them. I mean, heck, I've driven out to look at somebody's bus stop because I got a call from parents <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, explain this to me, you know, and, and our team, whenever there's a request, I, I will give our transportation team this credit. They really do drive out and look at it and and try to see if there's a, a reasonable change that can be made. So I think part of why you're not hearing as many complaints lately is because the team's been pretty responsive. But I do agree, people have to understand the why, especially when you see so many people are gonna get assigned to new bus stops perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it'll be stressful enough having the changes happen, but mm -hmm. your transparency is gonna be really important. Great. And, and then, <clears throat> I mean, you have a long history of, of uh dealing with these boundary change issues. Um, when, when we talk about, I mean, what do we anticipate most relative to pushback on, on boundary changes? Just, in other words, is it a communications issue where people feel blindsided? Is that pretty much the biggest thing we anticipate? Or 
Um, I mean, we're laying out a whole year's worth of process here, which is great. And, and thanks for doing that. Uh, but um, I'm just wondering, you know, what we anticipate relative to. I'll tell you in my experience, and I have been through boundary changes before in some of my previous roles, but I'll say this. The most important thing we can do is transparency and take our time with it. And I would say the fact that we've been talking about these, these school closures are not new. Mm -hmm. um, they've been really, really well vetted through the community and certainly our, our community supported us. And we did not in any way try to pass a referendum without making it clear that was part of the plan was to close those schools. So that um, is well underway. Every single um, grade that's entering a building now, if it's a building that's gonna be affected, as part of the welcome orientation right now with staff, for example, uh, middle school, sixth, grades or sixth graders in middle school right now, right? They're the ones who are gonna have to change before the end of middle school, pot perhaps. And right away at the, at the onset of that, there's communication about uh, how to try to make sure people feel like they understand and are aware of uh, these changes on the horizon as well. So I think the most important thing is gonna be transparency, communication every step of the way and, and continuing to publicly announce things. And I think, um, you know, we're gonna wanna continue to do mailing um, postcards to the community, announcing these things so people see how, they have, how it's all happening. So, yeah. One, one of the I'm, things, I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead, Nancy, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, I'm glad you said that because there is no newspaper anymore or anything. Mm -hmm. So the, the postcards and the letters and all of that would be yep. really important, yeah. They sure do. I think one of the maybe benefits for this year is that, you know, we're, we're anticipating that our community meetings will be in this format on Zoom, um, and then we can record them and we can post them on the website if people want to watch them after the fact if they're not on the committee. Any other questions for Josh or I about that? Josh, I, or Josh or Christine, I wanted to ask about two questions about the guiding principles for number one. I think it wasn't an accident that it says largely. And so I'm just wondering if you feel that um, like you're giving yourself wiggle room there just in case. And then also, can you just say a little bit more about number seven about the open enrollment kids? Yeah, absolutely. So it, um, in number seven, so if we have if we have cohorts of kids that have been together for a long time and they're open enrolled, perhaps we, we wanna try to move them together to the same school as much as we possibly can. Uh, we don't want to, we don't want to break up groups of kids that have been together for a long time. And so we're going to, to, again, to the extent possible, do our best to make sure they can move together. Um, and then yes, um, wiggle room is always good because we, you know, we don't know right now, something could come up in, in our, in our conversations, in our work that we might need to, um, might need to um, change something that we're not thinking about right now. So we want to make sure that we leave ourselves a little bit of wiggle room, knowing that these guiding principles um, may not be obtainable for every household, but we're going to do our best to impact the most um, amount of students and families as we can. Great. And then one more thing is there's no teachers or staff listed as included in that. Um, I can't remember what the group was called, but um, maybe that's due to potential bias or I'm not sure, but um, what about That's that? definitely definitely a discussion point. Yeah, we can we can definitely have that conversation for sure. It's not meant to leave anybody out at all, but we'll we'll definitely have that conversation. And we have had some of those conversations. Anyone else on this topic? Anything else on this topic? Okay, thanks a lot, Josh. Um, Christine, you had another agenda? I, I do, I have one more agenda item and it's the fun topic of COVID-19. Um, I am going to share my screen. Uh, oh, if I can get back to, okay. So I'm going to um, walk you through another update. Um, I wanna know that, I want you to know I did, uh, a lot of this information comes to us from Alicia Gustafson, our nurse. I know there's an interest in having her join our meetings. Um, we're also trying to have her get a little bit of sleep because she's got two babies at home and her, she's 24 seven right now. So I, I just have been asking her for updates um, to send to the board that we can kind of share. And so she's, she's definitely, you know, on speed.
dial as needed um, as well. So I just want to walk through a little bit of current information um, to give you something that um, a little context. Our COVID numbers are really rising, and we're going to have to make some more modifications. I'm going to recommend. So. Um, as you know, we have our COVID dashboard and Josh and team update this every Monday for the previous week. So this is the data that would that included last week uh, that was for last week. So um, we've got, you know, um, part of what we try to show like how many um, students are in the district and then how many not only are identified as actual positive cases, but who are close contacts because close contacts have to go home for 14 days. And so that's that's also challenging as well. Um, so this is just a look and anybody can see this. It's posted on our website, updated every week. Um, I wanna share a few other points with you. Alicia put together this lovely graph as well. Um, this is a look at the positive cases inside of our district community, okay? So um, this is in either staff and or students, okay? And, and staff is red and students is blue. And these are positive cases we are seeing in our schools, kids who've come to school. Um, but I want to add something that's notable here. Just for, la uh, just for yesterday and the day before, uh, the last couple of days, uh, we've had this many more added on the right. And I just added that in there because it's kind of starting to feel like we're drinking from a fire hose right now. Um, it's getting pretty intense. Um, Close contacts is a really big one. So while you can see at the bottom, um, the actual cases, or what you can see from the previous one, actual cases in our school of people testing positive is one thing. But what we're finding, because community spread is now so high, what often happens is a member of our, our school community, be it a student or a staff member, um, is identified as a close contact. Maybe a teacher, maybe one of their children now has become back positive uh, for COVID. And that person then has to stay home as part of the quarantine group with that one positive case. One positive case, depending on their contact tracing, can imp impact a lot of people. And so that's part of why the social distancing and masking and all that is so important. What you can see here is there's a, just a dramatic rise in the number of people that are close contacts. And, and I'll just tell you, um, every day the number of text messages that start flying in in the morning of the number of absentee rates of staff and students is just really growing pretty exponentially right now um through not necessarily anyone's fault or even the school's fault for not doing good work but people the community spread is so high right now so this is a little information from november 1st to 9th 81 new staff had to stay home due to COVID, either a positive test symptomatic or identified as a close contact since 8 a.m. this morning, 45 new staff and students have been notified. So think about this. That's since 8 a.m. this morning, and the number is still climbing. Today's been wild. I mean, the team's been going, um, going crazy um, trying to figure all that out. Uh, so I'm actually just checking my... Uh, just checking my phone because there's updates coming in all the time. Um, since we put our secondary program into distance learning, volleyball, football, and soccer have had to cancel games in practice. Tennis, show choir, and hockey have had cases but didn't have to quarantine in large, large numbers. So as you can see, we're really feeling the impact of this almost at every turn. And I think this particular bit of data just really says a lot. Um, and it's getting to the point where people are saying, I don't know how long we can keep up staying open. So let's look at the official data. The official data, as you know, is a two week lag. And apologize for my little rudimentary looking cut and pasting here, but I try to truncate the list because it's a really long one. So you can just see Ramsey and Washington. The latest data that we get official from the state has a two week lag to it. So we will get new numbers this Thursday. We get them every Thursday. And remember, the Washington County number is impacted by the outbreak, COVID outbreak at the Stillwater Prison. But the Washington County website has um, been segregating out that data so that we can see what the number is looking like without the prison data. And at last count on this date, the 
Washington County number was actually at 39 point something. So it really hadn't crossed over up, the, up that high yet. Another database we've been looking at is one that was created by a statistician at the University of Minnesota, a professor there, and I've shown you this before. This is a look at what is projected for Ramsey County. Now remember, Ramsey County doesn't have a prison in it that can explain any of it. This is just Ramsey County. Black dots are what the state has already posted in their official data counts. These little black dots are actual real data that's already been collected and published. It's not official till the state goes back and cleans it up, but what they have been finding is a very high correlation and accuracy. So this number here is data that's actually already occurring. It's just not made it into the official report yet. The purple boxes are not official things that have happened yet. These are future dates and where they believe it will be in the next couple of days. But this is just Ramsey County. And as you can see in Ramsey County, We've been under that 50. 50 is where the initial guideline kicks in where you're supposed to consider moving elementary students into distance learning as well. And you can see we're way back here with the official data count. This is very likely gonna be this Thursday's data report on Ramsey County. And this will likely be the one for the following week. And the following week is projected to be this high. I mean, it's really, really crazy. And I wanted to show you Ramsey first because Ramsey doesn't have a prison outbreak. Ramsey is more um, indicative of other counties around us. This is the uh, COVID projections for Washington County. And you can see they're way higher. In fact, Washington County is, is looking to be up near that 100 rate um, even before it, Ramsey County, but that's because Washington County also has some prison data in there. But what we're seeing is the prison data brings it down a notch or so, but it doesn't bring it anywhere near um, really safe levels. So um, again, these dots are what have already occurred and already been published as today's daily rates, but they have not been uh, certified by you, uh, uh, Department of Health. And that's where the black dots are, that lagging square of where those certifications are. The, the color coding on here just is a grid by what the initial stay at or safe at uh, school order from the governor included. And that was that Above 30, you're supposed to consider moving secondary uh, into distance. And above 50, consider moving elementary into all distance learning. And you can see, looking at the trends we're facing, we're, we're gonna blow this data out of the water. It's gonna be, it's almost unbelievable. And what we're seeing is that, like I told you, we all know and, and do believe that school is a pretty safe place to be. Um, we're not seeing a lot of kid to kid or staff to staff transmission happening inside of our buildings. However, we are really, really, really running into staff shortages right now because of the number of people being quarantined. So we are gonna need to look at transitioning our elementary schools to distance learning. And, and you're gonna start seeing this popping up all over, um, all over the Metro. I think yesterday Channel, Channel 5 had a, a good interview with Dan Bittman, who's the superintendent of Elk River explaining this very same thing on last night's evening news about its staffing ratios and staffing issues that we're having with so many people as community contacts. So here's what I'm bringing to you tonight for a recommendation. And my recommendation is that we actually look to moving elementary to full-time distance learning right after the Thanksgiving week uh, break, which is also a beginning of a new trimester for us. But that we also take a couple of days um, the week before Thanksgiving for elementary um, staff to actually spend some time preparing for a shift to distance learning. Now, the reason we didn't, the state allows up to five of these kinds of days between models um, and which you can cancel classes for students, but still count the days towards your daily membership of school attendance for the year. We did not, and we do feel like take using these very, very judiciously because canceling classes is never a good idea. Um, we didn't do that when we transitioned a secondary back to distance. And the reason for that is secondary had already been teaching distance learning for a whole month, had only been in hybrid for uh, about a month and then transitioned back. So they already had already had experience with it. For many of our elementary teachers, they've never taught distance learning. Uh, those who are full-time distance learning teachers do, but many of them who've been hybrid teachers since the beginning of school haven't taught distance learning classes yet. And this is about giving them time to prepare for that. And, and have some professional development. 
And then the recommendation at this point is that we just make a commitment to keeping elementary and secondary students in distance learning, at least through December. One thing we're hearing from our families is tell us ahead of time, don't just spring it on us if you're gonna make a big change, give us notice. So at least um, telling them that we're not gonna every two weeks make another announcement. I think it's a natural break to look again to winter break from Thanksgiving to winter break is only about three weeks of school, three weeks in a, in a day or two. And I think that that's a natural break to look to next. I think we also wanna commit that before winter break even begins, we make an announcement about what's gonna happen after winter break. What we don't wanna do is keep people hanging. The good thing is with the data sets we're able to look at with the U of M, we're able to get some data predictions a good couple of weeks ahead before the state puts them out officially. And it lets us get a lens into where the data is heading next. So that's also part of my recommendation that we make that announcement. Um, I wanna just also take a moment to just thank our, our staff who've been doing so much work with the PPE, the face shields, the contact tracing teams. I mean, unbelievable number of hours, day and night, weekends, contact tracing. Um, and then also not only our custodial team doing a lot of sanitizing, but uh, our bus drivers, when they're not driving routes or in buildings, also sanitizing to try to make sure we have safe environments. So all of this is not because they are not doing their jobs. I just wanna be really clear about that. We've had excellent, excellent um, performance by our team members here. Couple things that we're gonna to have to talk about if we think about next steps and if, if you guys feel okay with this proposal is, um, we've had a lot of discussions today among elementary principals and, and teachers about uh, which class list they're gonna, we sorted our students into distance learning and hybrid students when we did hybrid. And now that everybody's gonna teach distance, there's a conversation about whether we're gonna shuffle that up or keep them the same. There was a strong feeling from teachers and from administrators to keep everybody with the same students right now even though there's some larger class sizes and some that don't, even the teachers with the larger ones said, it's just easier to keep the same kids I've been working with. Planning for supports and intervention. We've said all along, whenever we've been in distance that we wanna continue at least bringing in our highest needs students. Um, some of our center-based or multiple needs students who really don't learn well at home and continue to provide that intervention and support for them. The state now in their latest updates have been also publicizing to everybody that that's what they want us to do as well continue to bring in students for interventions and supports. One of the challenges with that, I'll just be really frank, um, it's gonna get harder and harder with numbers as high as they are predicted to be, to find staff who really are comfortable, you know, being the only few who still work with students in person. So we're trying to come up with some creative ideas for how we are going to organize that. We also know our attendance has been, as people are concerned about their kids' health too, there's been a lot of drop off of attendance. So we're We've got um, teams together working on ideas for how to kind of maximize interventions and supports through both virtual and some in-person work as well. We're gonna have to continue to talk about planning for athletics and activities. I already mentioned to you that a number of them have already been shut down this fall, but then what does that mean for winter? One of the challenges um, that has really come up with the state is that they gave us that guidance at the beginning, right? So. Um, I'm going to go back to that one slide, the one, this one, right? So this initial guidance says, uh, you know, elementary hybrid, middle and high school from 30 to 50, both distance at 50 or more. The problem is this was published in July, since July, and actually in the last few weeks, they've been saying, oh, but you don't have to just use your county data. You also should use your local data. And, um, and that's true. And our local data actually shows that we're having staffing issues, as most are seeing as well. But one of the things this doesn't do very well for us is tell us, okay, so when do we come back? So if it dips, if it dips to 49, am I supposed to bring elementary back? Well, that's not practical. Families don't want to be turned around and sent back out again the next week. They want to have some consistency. How many weeks should it be dropping? And for how much by how much before we make the decision to flip it back? We as superintendents are really pushing on the state to help with guidance on that right now because everybody's going to be having these conversations. And it'd be really great if each district doesn't have to kind of reinvent the wheel on that. So there's a little bit of nuance to what happens next. And so when I put that on here, planning for future transition, when does a transition happen back and how, how quickly after the data gets into the reasonable ranges. And then um, also we wanna be able to resurvey families again and say, okay, if we do come back, how many of you would send your child in person? Um, as you recall, part of the reason in secondary that we didn't do four days of hybrid or two and two 
is because we just didn't have very many kids signing up for hybrid at all. They were staying in distance. But if we could get more to sign up, then we could obviously change the model. So that's part of recollecting data from families about where they're, how they're feeling again. Uh, probably I would think of by, by the end of winter break, we're gonna check that, wanna check that again. And continuing to be transparent. And part of what I wanna be transparent about, like if with this announcement today, if this goes through tonight and we put out a big memo to the world tomorrow morning, I wanna say, and here's the next date, you will get an update. So you don't have to sit around and wait and not know about January. We did that the last time when we moved secondary to distance. We made a commitment that by November 20th, we would let people know what would happen for December. And I would love to be able to beat that date and have an announcement much sooner than that. And I think the data is pretty clear that it's really, really going the wrong direction for everybody. So um, with that, I'll take any comments and questions. By the way, I'd like to just add, all of this is awful. It's awful for learning. It's awful for families. It's awful for childcare. And it is absolutely the opposite of where we'd like to see things going right now. But at the same time, it's becoming, I mean, every minute we're tracking down so many cases right now, it's getting really hard to operate. Um, Christine, I'll just say that throughout this, I've had a lot of feedback from parents that they want their kids in school. They want to, you know, they want athletics open, um, so on. But um, the numbers are just, I mean, it's not, ten, I mean, it's, it, it's, they're too high. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the announcements from the governor as well with the ICU beds being full and the, um, on Friday, the MSBA meeting with the commissioners of health and education and the governor, they said that asymptomatic spread among um, young people is driving a lot of the community spread. So I think there's the idea that the kids are, you know, playing sports and going to, you know, interacting in a lot of ways and they're not getting sick, but they're still spreading the virus. And at some mm -hmm. point I feel like it becomes irresponsible for us to continue to um, promote keeping things open. Mm -hmm. And I think for me personally, that points now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's hard, it's really hard. I don't have any questions. I think your data is really thorough. Um, I really appreciate getting this viewpoint from the, um, the team at the university. Um, so always getting this information as thorough, as thoroughly as you present it really makes me confident that you guys are doing all that you can to stay on top of this. Um, it's, it, it's so important right now and I can see how important um, it is to you guys too. If I could add one other comment, something we're talking a lot about right now, we have to completely rethink how we do summer programming next summer, after school programming next fall. We have a lot of academic catch up ahead of us and we are gonna really need to prioritize and rethink how do we build the best, most alluring programs that kids wanna be a part of and that we'll stay engaged with in the most amount of time possible because once once we're able to be back in person, we have a lot of work to do. It is it's 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 horrible how far our kids are failing. Uh, I I know that we probably don't even know the impact of it yet and won't probably for quite some time. I heard an analogy said today. Um, one of the probably one of the best examples, at least from a microcosmic perspective, about all this would be Katrina in New Orleans, um, the eight years later, the data they showed on kids and what had happened uh, educationally uh, when Katrina hit and the long, long-term impact on the communities and the state as a whole um, are really still being measured to this day. And I, I can't even imagine what the impact of COVID is gonna be in the long-term, um, not only locally, nationally, but even internationally. 
I'd like to add that I think that that's a, a very important perspective in the work that we have ahead of us. You know, I've, I've always maintained in these discussions that we have a role as, as the largest employer and leaders in the community to make sure that we lead the way and do what's right. And I think an important part of that, especially now with all the discussion about the vaccine, it's very important that we help our community stay focused on on the numbers and, and what's really happening. And I also agree that as we move through this and if the vaccines are effective and we start talking about opening up our communities and our schools again, we have to be sure that we don't leave these kids behind. Um, Christine, relative to uh, staffing problems, um, if, if, a, if a teacher is quarantined but not ill, um, can he or she still uh, teach distance learning? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that's, that's exactly it. We have access to all kinds of folks who can still do their work. In fact, we've been really intentional that even paraprofessionals and others who have to be quarantined, that we don't want them to have to take sick days. We've been intentional about finding work that they can be doing from home as well, because our paraprofessionals and other academic supports can be phone calling students and families and um, providing uh, tutoring either online or by phone, uh, lots of different ways that we can provide supports and, and what have you. So that is the great thing. At least we can really maximize our staffing because so much of it is due to quarantining. And even some of those who've had been homesick with actual COVID have often tended to be sick for a little window of time, but then they've been, they still have to stay home for a little longer, but they're starting to feel pretty good and they'd be willing to do the work if they could be able to be online. But I'll tell you, there's other, beyond just our teaching group, our grounds crew, is completely gone because they're all quarantined, every one of them. Uh, all it takes is one or two cases who've had contact. We've got a major impact to our transportation department, not just by having a lot of people with COVID, but a lot of people who are close contacts, you know? And so it's, it's beyond just um, even our teaching staff as well. There's lots of other groups that have been affected. I'm yeah. glad that our focus seems to be keeping these kids alive, <laughs> right? And help and, the, and their parents and, you know, and their and grandparents. They will catch up. They will catch up. Mm -hmm. I, I'm optimistic that they will, and we'll redouble our efforts, and mm -hmm. we'll, you know, we'll, we'll we'll catch them up. But we have to keep them alive <laughs> and out of the hospital. And we have to keep their parents and their grandparents alive. Right. <laughs> I mean, to the best extent we can. Because I, as I think Michelle said, that the uh, asymptomatic carrier is quite the risk to many other people in the community as well. I think too, you know, you talk about those things and we absolutely are doing our part. At the same time, you know, listening to the governor today, the spread is community spread. It's the same issue that the hospitals are having. The staff aren't getting sick because they're taking care of sick patients. They're getting sick because they're out in the community. And so while we can do this part of it um, and we should be doing it. It's our responsibility to do it with school. I would hope that we could get our families to be doing, um, doing their part as well, just like the governor said, and trying to really be careful about what you're doing out in public and trying to, to mitigate some of that community spread. It's so important because, you know, there are so many cases if, if people can avoid that, they wouldn't have to bring it and, and we wouldn't have to quarantine so many people for one positive case or, or five positive cases. I listened to the governor's um, press conference today too. And again, the community spread is not from people going to the grocery store or retail stores. It's, it's from um, gatherings of, of family. It's from weddings and funerals and, and people getting together for a backyard, whatever it's not, we're not going to do backyards in the snow, but, uh, but I mean, that kind of thing. Um, and, and of course, bar, you know, where you, where these droplets, um, you know, are, are, uh, transmitted and interesting. He was talking about, you know, uh, how starting Friday, 10 o'clock, there's a curfew now in bars and restaurants. And, um, 
and he talked about how alcohol um people's you know inhibitions are lowered and they're this you know they're the masks come off and you know whatever so he's hoping that curfew um will um will have an impact um uh, relative to the um you know uh, bars and restaurants and, and family gatherings yep any other comments or questions about this Thanks to our WOLD team for being patient here. <laughs> I know you've all been sitting in here for a long superintendent check-in, but uh, yeah, I think it's really important and timely. Christine, when, when are we gonna make this announcement to the parents? We'll be making that announcement tomorrow. We wanna give people as much notice as possible. Okay, thank you. I, I think that uh, just with our, our staff, our teachers and everyone else that works with our kids, um, I think we need to make them safe and uh, I don't want anybody to feel afraid of going into our schools for their lives or for their, their family's lives or their health and it's really unfortunate but I, I think with the current rates that we have with the projections I feel like we have to go this route so um, I, I just want to thank you for all the data um, and your presentation. Thank you Caleb. And we'll make this data as, as before, we'll make this presentation public as part of our sharing out with families too, so they can look at it as well. Okay. All right, thanks, Christine. Um, should we hand it off to the WOLD team? Yes, I don't know if Randy or Jenna have an intro or we're just gonna jump right in with Vaughn. Uh, however you guys wanna work this. <laughs> I think we can go ahead and jump right in. We're excited to have Wold back. They're going to talk to us a little bit tonight about our high schools and the design process so far with our high schools. Thanks okay. for having us back. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering if we could have screen sharing permissions. I don't know who is technically the host. Josh is. So you should have uh, co-hosting duties now so you can share. Oh, that's a big responsibility. Thanks, Josh. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having us and please don't apologize for keeping us on. I, um, it's a really important conversation and I think um, it's really, uh, we, don't, we don't mind it at all. So um, I'm Sal Bagley with Wold Architects and Engineers. Um, other members of our team are on the call. You guys wanna introduce yourselves? Vaughn Dirks with Wold Architects and Engineers. And I'm Caitlin Chambers also with Wold Architects and Engineers. We have a couple other team members who you might see in the future, but we really appreciate this opportunity to give you all an update on where we're at with the high school project. So we're nearing the end of what we call schematic design for both Tartan and North. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about process and show you the work that the core planning groups have put together. So I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, so we'll talk about scope, project goals and criteria, and then dive um, in, in particular depth into both North and Tartan. So project scope, um, we've got Tartan on the left here, um, provide capacity for 1800 students. That does include demolition of the existing circle classroom towers um, for a variety of reasons that were explored in the referendum planning process. Um, and those will be replaced through a variety of additions and renovations to create space for kitchen and cafeteria, um, a reimagined media center, classrooms and labs, gymnasium and support spaces in special education, as well as a new secure entry and main office a prevalent theme of the referendum. Um, and lots of common themes over at North, just the solution looks different. So we are still aiming for capacity of 1800 at North um, and additions and renovations focused on the media center, the appropriate number of classrooms and labs, special education and secure entry. And I, th uh, I think I would add in general, just, uh, just to add to that cell, a lot of this is what we talked about over the course of the process between the elementary schools and the work at the middle schools and the high schools is uh, we work very closely with your administration to try and figure out how are things equitable for all students, no matter what their experience is. How do we get Tartan and North to be more equitable, not only in terms of capacity, but the programs and how we're um, looking at the design of the buildings. And so you'll see that very similar to how we handled the elementary schools and the middle school renovations as we went forward. Good point, Vaughn. So in addition to the work we're going to share with you tonight, or maybe to build upon it, um, we do meet with um, 
Randy, Mike, and Jenna every other Monday. And then we've now started meeting with um, kind of high school leadership every other Tuesday so that we can stay in constant touch on that. So, um, so here's obviously a map of the district with the two high schools called out, um, North and Tartan. Um, just a high level planning and construction schedule. I won't get into the details here, but um, we were in schematic design from kind of the beginning of the summer all the way through um, November for Tartan and uh, end of October for North. So North is slightly ahead of Tartan, just given the project scale and complexity. Um, so we are just diving into design development, which will go through um, like April of next year for Tartan. Then we'll roll into construction documents with the intent that um, bidding and construction, you'll see much more action at the high schools starting about the middle of 2021, so that summer and certainly the years to follow. Um, and they have slightly different construction schedules, but um, taking advantage of summers for renovation and then building additions throughout the school year, as you all, all have gotten very familiar with with your other projects, um, to aim towards that occupancy at the um, very end of the schedule there in uh, 2023 for, Tart or for North and 2024 for Tartan. And there's an awful lot of detail in this presentation. We assume that you're going to want to read all about this and go back after the board meeting and spend hours to go through it. So we'll kind of hit the high level today. Yeah. Um, you all know this, but for the public who might be watching, the referendum scope applicable at the high schools is provide safe and secure environment, the appropriate amount of capacity for 1,800 students, equity, and then um, last but not least, creating flexible and innovative teaching and learning spaces. I'm not gonna read all of these as Vaughn said, um, but what we did is um, developed uh, core planning groups for each North, each of North and Tartan, um, similar to how we did for the elementary and middle school projects. Those are made up of a representative group of teachers, staff and administration for each building. And we work with them to develop the vision, mission and goals of the project. For the high schools, we actually started them by having a couple meetings with those two planning groups together. Again, with that um, eye towards consistency and um, a holistic experience. And these were the statements that they created. So guiding principles, I highlighted in orange kind of the key concepts, maximizing flexibility, being safe while balancing that with being welcome, um, lots of opportunities for collaboration and flexible learning, and daylight was a high um, of high value to the core planning groups. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking about the media center experience and what it should look like in the future and how that should be a learning commons for the building and support a wide, really wide variety of activities. Uh, how important it is that the main entry is easy to find and what should be directly next to the main entrance. And uh, in particular at both high schools, what the lunch experience looks like, including a variety of seating options. Uh, and they came up with the idea that it should be similar to a student union at a university. Uh, design criteria, these are another type of statement. Um, these are really them telling us this needs to be next to this to support this. Um, so I won't read these, but those, these are really how we develop a floor plan with them. So we go back and forth on writing these statements bringing back a diagram um, and critiquing one or the other so that they're in alignment. And we have just recently finished up our work with the core planning group um, to create these. And in general too, the high school groups really, they had to build off what your middle school and your elementary groups already did. They already did a lot of this heavy lifting. And uh, we kept going back to, if your elementary students are going to middle school and they're experiencing these types of uh, spaces and these types of things, you want to make sure that they can continue doing that at the high school and take it to the next level as opposed to having it limited at the high school. So they had to refer to a lot of that groundwork that the middle school teams had already laid. Good point. So we'll dive right into North. Um, this is the existing site plan of North. You guys are probably all very familiar, but um, here's the North building. Main entrance is on the east side. Receiving is also on that side. And then this is 11th Avenue. Um, just an aerial view for if you're not a floor plan reader, um, the staff and visitor parking is on the east side, student parking on the west, and primarily staff parking on the south. And the existing building diagram. So just really quickly hit these are this is how the building is currently organized. So on the first floor or lower level, we have some world language, language arts, facts, and the forum space, as well as the majority of your athletic space, the gym, weights, and locker rooms. Auto shop is also down here. On second floor, which is the level that the main entrance is on, we've got our main office, our music suite, auditorium, the cafeteria commons, the media center, and more of your classroom space, including social studies and art. 
And last but not least, up on um, the upper level or third floor, we have the majority of science, math, language arts, and actually business is up here. So that's the existing building diagram. Um, Vaughn, you want to talk through what, what's being proposed? Absolutely. So um, right now, uh, in order to bring up the capacity a little bit, we're actually looking at an addition that would be off the back of the classroom building to the west or the northwest corner of the building. Um, we'll be providing a secure entrance at the office space as we come in. And so part of that uh, requires us to take a look at parking and traffic patterns on the site as a whole. It's a little bit of a tangled mess right now. If you've ever been there at the end of the day, I'm sure uh, um, you've experienced that. And so we're going to try and streamline that process, make it a lot easier, separating bus traffic from students as we come in, uh, bringing buses into a dedicated lot as opposed to parking them on the street, uh, and really trying to improve the overall pedestrian and vehicular safety on the site. Uh, we've been meeting with the city to take a look at stormwater requirements and other, uh, other issues that will come into play here as we go forward. The addition on this building is a lot smaller than the one to Tartan. This is your newer building in terms of the high school catalog here. And so a lot of our uh, conversation revolved around, well, what other types of impact can we have inside the building? And so we'll take you inside now and show you some diagrams of how that works. And then we'll get into some more scaled in um, looks as we go forward. So there's, you can see the classroom addition off to the side there in that last um, Last image. Uh, we're going to try and make it blend in with the building. It really doesn't need to stand out here. We want to make sure that this is as seamless of an addition as possible. So going inside the building, um, one of the things you probably uh, have experienced is that this is what we call a double loaded corridor building existing wise. It's classroom spaces or lab spaces on either side of a hallway, which really doesn't leave a lot of that extended learning environment or that breakout environment for small group activities for students to work independently uh, to provide resource area. And so with the addition, we have the opportunity of taking that exterior west wall off where we're adding the spaces and really creating a flexible learning environment in between those rooms. Uh, because it's an addition, it gives us more ability to do that. Then the conversation went with the planning group in terms of, is there other things we can do to make that happen inside the rest of the classroom building? And so we looked at those opportunities and renovation as we went from the first floor to second floor to third floor as we go through. And so maybe you can highlight some of those as we're going up in the levels moving forward. Um, the other aspect of the building that was um, a big one was how do we create more of those common spaces? Our media centers very enclosed, our cafeterias enclosed. We don't feel like we have the common spaces that we've seen at other high schools. And so we looked at how we can open those spaces as well. Maybe we should go up to the next yeah. level up. The media center you can see now, uh, we basically eroded the walls all the way around the media center still creating that secure environment for books, the ability to lock up those assets outside of school hours, but pro, uh, provide more of a cohesive student commons as you blend through the space. A lot more uh, openings in the hallways as we go through the area, providing those uh, breakout areas. Uh, the office addition, very simple. It's just a small vestibule addition to the front. It gives us the ability to reorganize somewhat in the office, but that's the simple part to the project and creating that secure vestibule where all visitors will come through the building in the end. And these are high level. Sal's gonna show you some blow ups here in just a second, but on the third floor, again, more of that renovation space uh, around the math rooms. We've uh, uh, taken out one of the corners of that space to create a little bit more of that flexible environment. And so as we're looking at that addition, we're balancing what's the new capacity for the building need to be and how can we uh, remove some of those uh, tighter spaces inside the building as we go through. Harder to see in this kind of diagram. So maybe if we jump into the blowups, uh, it'll be a little bit more obvious. Yeah, thanks, Ben. So um, this is the lower and main um, level. It's actually essentially the same on both of those two floors for the classroom addition. Third floor is where we're getting the additional science labs that are needed. Um, the existing building ends about right here. If you can see on these diagrams, the gray walls mean existing and black means they're new. Um, so the proposal would be to actually take the two classrooms that are right here right now move them over a little bit and have them turn and face the new addition. So it's a series of classrooms that surround a flexible learning area, very similar to the other projects that you've been seeing. Um, some other assets that were really important to the core planning group was presence of SPED um, resource areas on every floor, um, as well as small group rooms. So like conference rooms that might be enclosed. So if you don't wanna work in an, in an open environment that you have access to that. Um, one interesting thing here is that the uh, building code changed towards the end of spring to require any educational space um, addition or new building to um, be designed as a, a tornado shelter to enclose all the occupants. So we actually have to do that at North as well as at Tartan. 
Um, so the classroom edition will be designed to withstand an F4 tornado. Um, certainly been an interesting thing to go through. So um, there will be some shutters and a series of doors that most of the time people won't notice or realize, but in a storm that you can close and um, this will be rated to withstand that. Also has to have um, dedicated mechanical systems and uh, emergency power and lights and things like that. Um, the core planning group really wanted access to this type of flex space within a reasonable distance from every classroom, even if they were in the existing. So on the lower and main level, um, access here was important. And then Vaughn pointed out up on third level, the core planning group felt like the Eastern area was too far from the addition. So the proposal to explore another flex space up there via renovation was important. Um, some other things, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, we'll be working with your purchasing uh, group as well in the acquisition of furniture, which is just as important to these as the architecture itself to make sure that there's appropriate, flexible learning environment furniture, not just uh, sled based desks attached to a chair, but really spaces where students can achieve that one on one. Good point, Vaughn. Um, access to some um, gender neutral restrooms on all levels was very important to the core planning group as well. So you'll see some presence of that. That's some of these gray boxes. Um, this is an, a view, um, it's kind of like we took the roof off or the ceiling off and we're just looking down into it. Um, like I said, we are at the end of schematic design, so we certainly have um, plenty of detail yet to go, but this was a graphic we used with the core group to capture their ideas. So the classrooms surrounding the flexible learning environment, they felt that any classroom that had um, really appropriate frontage under that flexible learning environment wanted to be able to physically break out. So they, after lots of discussion, decided to explore some sort of um, sliding glass door solutions. So you can see that on these four classrooms and or these five actually um, right here. Um, and then it was important to have transparency for any other classroom as well. So the, the two corner classrooms and the sped classroom. Um, and then we get into a lot more detail um, with these types of drawings in the user group process. We are actually kind of just wrapping up uh, having met with all of the impacted teachers at North for the first time. Um, and we're kind of gearing up to do it at Tartan for the first time um, in the upcoming weeks. So we asked them about storage and where light switches should go and where we need power and what where marker boards should go and get into a lot of detail. So this is really all just a suggestion. Um, upper level science lab. So there's a three additional labs to get up to the needed capacity of 1800 students with associated prep areas um, and offices. There's a staircase that connect all three levels, obviously. Um, as well as they have some flexible space, very similar to the main and lower levels. And again, a similar axon here. So we've got our lab surrounding the flexible learning area. Um, you will see that around a previous plan, we labeled them. They're not all intended to be the exact same as science is a highly specialized discipline. So whether it's chemistry versus physics versus earth sciences, there are some slight differences they need. Um, and then we zoom into the media center. So the um, core planning group was very um, invigorated by the idea of breaking down the barrier between the media center and the commons, as well as the media center in this um, hallway in the academic area, um, and re really rearranging to maximize flexibility. So um, getting the book collection to fit in an area that can be lockable, but is open during the day so that you could have presentations in the evenings or weekends without worrying about your books walking off a series of enclosed breakout spaces for small and medium sized groups, and then locating a lot of student supports in the media center, um, which is really st where students spend a lot of their time. This will be a major aesthetic transition in this building and really opening up that corner and not having it feel like it's defined by the hallways, but having it feel like it's a cohesive uh, learning space throughout. This is one of those um, axon diagrams. So you can see a little bit. So we've got those small group breakout. Um, this is the opening to the hallway that is lockable. Um, there's intended to be an operable wall there if you wanted to lock it at night. Um, and then here's the stack area. And again, the media desk at the corner kind of providing a central anchor and the ability to open or close these operable walls as you um, see fits your needs. Uh, last but not least, our zoom in at the secure entry. Um, so there's a proposal to add um, as much space as needed to get our weather vestibule and our secure vestibule. We tried to show a dash line here for exactly what's new versus existing. And then some minor reorganizations inside to get the appropriate relationships to match all of the rest of the secure entries you've done as a part of the referendum. And as we said, uh, uh, because this is your newer building, it doesn't have as many of the physical issues as Tartan has, but we are working with Mike and your team to 
look at anywhere that um, you have long-term facility maintenance items coming up and seeing what makes sense to put into the construction documents now and really maximize the economy of scale and the efficiency as we go into bidding. Uh, so now we'll move to Tartan. Um, existing site diagram, or Vaughn, you were gonna do this one, right? Go ahead. Sure, uh, Tartan is a little bit uh, a different site here. We've got uh, some tight residential, obviously, to the south. Uh, and the bulk of this really revolves around those classroom towers in the front of the building, the circles there, as well as the, uh, the polar arena, or excuse me, the arena on site there, not the polar arena, um, and the fact that that will be coming down. So we've got an opportunity now to take a look at how does parking work on this site again, um, how does this building need to be phased, which is a pretty complicated process. Obviously we can't tear down the building because you want to make a place for the students to go. So we have to figure out how do we build replacement space for the students on the same site uh, at the same time that they're occupying the existing towers, keep everything safe, and then make for a um, smooth transition into the new building as soon as occupancy is allowed. So we're gonna have a couple of different phases as we go through and that really drove a lot of the design. Um, our staff and visitor parking is in front. Our student parking is in back right now on the existing site. And you're going to see a reversal of that in the new design to make it a lot more cohesive approach to how we uh, work the site. So some existing building diagrams here. You can see the, the circles, the dash line really indicates what's scheduled for demolition on those buildings. So we're retaining the areas of the building. We, we call it the square. Uh, because you've made a lot of investments, especially to the specialty classroom areas in that building over the years. You've done a lot of work to um, science, to the tech spaces, to art spaces. Uh, but we also have that existing gym, which is not uh, two full stations. It makes it very difficult for practices and other activities to happen. And in looking at the building, that became also a key for us in terms of how can we phase our design and our construction to make things work uh, really well. Kitchen and cafeteria also has to get torn down, and so we had to build that into the phasing. Uh, as we go up, more of the same here. Your main entry is actually up at the middle level on this site. And then the top floor is just the classroom circles as we go through. So um, criteria again, um, very similar in terms of some of the other things that we looked at at North and we won't read through all these, but this was the rules that we used to figure out our adjacencies and how we set up the design. I encourage you to read that after the presentation, but here's the big diagram. So you look at this and you say, that doesn't look like a plan that looks more like a science experiment or a science slide. I assure you, it gives us the idea of what we're trying to do here. So we knew that the media and the commons wanted to be the heart of the building. Um, obviously we wanna have people come in adjacent to a main entry space as we come in, uh, but we also try and organize our public spaces around those commons if we're designing high schools new. We want our activities area, our auditorium area to be around that commons because it acts as lobby space uh, for those events. And then our classroom spaces and our specialty spaces round out that diagram as we go all around. So with that in mind, we looked at the existing building and said, if we can figure out how to replace the athletics piece first, we could actually go into that two-story shell space you have in the heart of the building and create that as our media and our common space. And so that drove a lot of the design as we go forward. And we'll follow the same process where Sal will jump into detail as we go, uh, go through this. So as I mentioned, we're proposing flipping the student parking and the staff parking on site for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, staff can come into the west side of the building, they have card access and we can keep that secure, but students during the day will come in that main entry if they're coming late to school. Instead of parking in the back and having to come all the way around the front, they now come directly to the main uh, office as they come into the building. We'll have designated visitor parking in front, we're extending the queue space so as parents come onto the site they're not backing up out into the streets and really uh, streamlining that drop off and pick up process as well. Buses will still continue along the south side of the building, but we're able to expand our staff parking um, on site with this as well uh, to the west. You can see the new addition space. And basically what we're proposing is we'll be building the new gyms and classroom space to the north of the building first. And once those are ready to be occupied, then we tear down the circles over the summer and work on making that transition happen. We have a small addition off the face of the building for the admin. We've got another small addition for science off to the south to complete this. And then we're renovating that existing gym space as part of the process as soon as the new gym space is up and running. And as Sal mentioned, our new storm requirements mean that we have to provide space for all of the students in this building. 
uh, of our gym space, we'll be uh, creating one of those auxiliary gym uh, components as our storm shelter. So that would house your entire student uh, population in a storm event. And I was just going to make one other comment that um, to really make sure that there's an appropriate amount of green space for a high school of this size on this site, it is proposed that um, Oakdale Elementary School be demolished, um, as well as the arena. So to try to get the right amount of access to fields, green space, parking, um, and obviously the building footprint has significantly expanded as well. Just wanted to make that comment. Correct. And we're dealing with a lot of um, stormwater management on this site as well. Um, uh, because we know that there's not only uh, the addition will cause issues, but there's also existing issues that we'll try and be uh, resolving as we go forward. And the addition gives us the opportunity to deal with uh, what's now known as the river that runs underneath the building. And so we hope to take care of that so we don't have future issues as we go forward. I might be being uh, dramatic right now by calling it the river, but I've heard Mike call it that before, so I figure it's okay. Uh, just a blow up of the site here. But let's go inside the building now. So this is a diagram of the new uh, new spaces for the building. It's color coded much like our diagram. So our big gym and fitness spaces to the northeast. Uh, this will now uh, make your gym spaces equitable with what's at north. So now we'll have the same number of gym stations at both. Uh, there'll be a walking track as part of this for the community to use. Uh, by how we're structuring it, it's actually two gyms and two gyms. So you'll have a, a competition gym and a second auxiliary gym. So you could actually have two separate games going on at any given time. Um, you could also be using the uh, two gyms for practice space while you have games going on. So there's a little more flexibility there. Uh, and the fitness center that will look out over the stadium to the north. The blue spaces represent the commons area. And we're actually down at the lower level right now. So the main level up above is where you come into the space, but our kitchen will be moved towards the inside of the building here. And the dark blue space uh, wraps out towards the north. Uh, that's more of our dining seating area, uh, but it also provides flex learning space during the day for students. Our science is expanding out to the south with some flex learning space appropriate to the science suites. And then our classroom, special ed, resource spaces all to the north uh, in a couple of different wings here with lots of glass. And again, we're going to jump inside so you can get a lot more um, visual of that as we go. But let's go up to the next level, which is really our main uh, entry and main office space here. Student services is directly below that admin piece, so more of the student to staff um, grouping below, our public to staff grouping up above, uh, main primary um, center-based special education right off that main uh, entry coming in to minimize our travel distances. And the two white spaces here are openings between the floor plates. So we can get daylight down into that area that we're not limited with that very low one-story level in the building to get some more space, help with acoustics, help with daylight as we come in all around that common space or the heart to the building. Fax moves out to the common spaces. So it's got a lot of visual presence, a lot of glass, a lot of ability to showcase what's happening in those areas. And our classroom spaces um, are very similar to what we're uh, talking about at North, but we're starting from scratch here. And so we've got more flexibility and a little easier um, job of making those flex learning spaces. Art and music, as I mentioned, you've made significant investments in those over the years. So we don't have to touch those as much. And then the upper level, uh, similar to before, it's classroom space uh, like it was in the circle towers, uh, but now it's out to the northeast. So from a phasing standpoint, we'll be building the project to the north first, demolishing the circles, and then filling in the front of the building. So it'll be um, several steps of occupancy as we go through. Now let's uh, actually get into the building a little bit more and take a look at it as we, as we move forward here. So the bubble diagram didn't have quite the level of detail here, but as we get ready for uh, the audience, oh, I have an echo. Let me try that again. Um, as we get ready for the user group meetings, we're um, learning a lot more and more about the building and getting into level of detail. So just to orient people, this dashed line is um, new versus renovation. Um, so the circle buildings would be above us here or kind of right to our right. Um, the kitchen servery is planned to be built inside the existing uh, gym volume, as Vaughn mentioned, and connect directly to the commons cafeteria. We have our athletic locker rooms, um, athletic office, some storage, and then we make our way into the game gym. Um, so two courts with a center striped game court, um, bleachers on either side, and then a walking track around it. 
On this level, we have our weights and fitness space. And then here is the auxiliary gym with the other two courts, um, as well as our team locker rooms. So there's some nice connectivity there to the stadium and other fields to the north. Um, the classroom wing um, is intended to be flexible for the future. We have them labeled by um, department so we can make sure that we have a space for everybody. So we've got um, math and world language on this floor. Um, and then these that are labeled SPED resource are really meant to be flexible for the future, whether they're um, used for that or uh, interventions or EL of some kind, but really important that those were incorporated. There's a presence of some staff space. So if a staff is not prepping in, the, in a classroom that they can have a landing pad, do collaboration, et cetera. And then last but not least on this floor, we have our um, science expansion. So an additional three labs, um, as well as some renovation of existing labs to get the right number of spaces in this part. Student services directly below the main office, along with student support. And then one of the two forum rooms is planned to be on this floor as well as a part of the new addition. Gray spaces are things like um, bathrooms, mechanical rooms, electrical rooms, et cetera. So well, much like the middle schools, we're going with gender neutral bathrooms throughout the facility. Yes. So then if we go upstairs again to orient you, these openings to below, I might toggle back. You can kind of see them ghosted in here. So there'd be a significant amount of daylight here and here. You can track them on the main level. So those will um, be visual connectivity between the upper commons and the lower commons. Right at the front door is the administration for our secure, vest, secure and weather vestibules, um, as well as the media center, very integrally connected with the, the student commons. We have our um, cluster programs, Creed, FAN, CID, and multiple needs um, located, like Vaughn said, very near the entry, as well as near admin for support. And then our second forum room is located near the auditorium. So that'll be a part of the addition. Uh, FACS, utilizing a couple existing rooms, and then as a part of the addition, supplementing that with a third space and some storage. Um, and then here's the walking track level around that gym. So um, spectators can actually come in the main entrance, go through the commons, and then they'd be on walking track level and load the bleachers from above, which is really nice separation for athletes. Uh, right above the uh, fitness and weights downstairs, we've got a health classroom and the rest of fitness and weights um, with views out to the stadium. And then the classroom wing is really very similar on all three levels. Maybe one thing to note here is that um, the business department has presence here due to their um, desire to have school store um, have really strong presence on the commons. Um, and then we've got our coffee, coffee cave and our um, cookie area also very prominently located as you walk in. Another thing school. we might point out is um, one of those two floor openings is very, very dynamic in that it's actually a wider learning stair from the top as you come in at that main entry going down towards that uh, lower level commons area. So that serves as sort of public plaza space. It can be presentation space. Students can eat on that area during the day and it tapers up right towards the media center as we come up. So super dynamic space right inside that main entry. Thanks, Fun. And then last but not least, we've got our third floor of the classroom wing. Um, and then uh, we are also able to get um, a nice amount of daylight up on this floor because um, there's no existing building that would block so we can get even more daylight on this side as well. So um, wanna, this is a kind of an overall massing. This is not the proposed color palette, but um, color coded to match the diagram. So we've got our classroom edition here, our gymnasium edition, um, administration and uh, media center edition on the front of the building. And then last but not least, the science edition on the lower level with student and visitor parking in the front or east side of the building and staff parking in the back or west side. Sal, can you just quick add in, point where is the current entrance right now? I'm trying to orient myself. It would be like out here. Okay. Because um, a little bit of what we did here um, is we were Photoshopping out the circles, right? So you can yep. kind of see them if you're looking for them. So it'd be a little bit out here. I gotcha. That yeah. actually increases the amount of parking on the front of the building as well. So as we move our students to the front and we have visitors, our parking expands on the east. Definitely needed. Yeah, there's certainly in high demand. Mm -hmm. um, and we mentioned it with North, but we have also been working with the city of Oakdale pretty closely about, um, about this, especially as we think about phasing and um, how traffic will work differently on the site. Um, so here's a zoom into um, one of the classroom pods. It really could be any floor, um, but it shows a series of classrooms around that flexible learning area with some of their key components that the core planning group wanted. The presence of special education resource rooms, um, some enclosed conference rooms, uh, some staff, staff space for staff who might benefit from being out by students, 
as well as access to a staff landing pad or office space, uh, and then bathrooms on all three floors. I think if I go one more, yep, here we go. Here's one of those axons again. Um, very similar conversations at North and we did our, or at Tartan and um, to cross pollinate between them and North about what the experience would look like. Um, so they, they too um, landed on the idea of connectivity between the classrooms and the flexible learning area um, for classrooms that have good frontage with some sort of sliding glass door system, um, as well as some discussion about how great it would be if they had some spaces that could scale up. So that this is a proposal that these two rooms actually could expand and become a double classroom. Um, and there's some presence of that on all three floors. So that was important to the Tartan Core Planning Group. They could also open those two rooms up and open them to the flex learning space. So it really becomes the size of about three plus classrooms in that area. So you could do a lot of large group learning in that area. I have to just toss in here how much this would have been really handy to have this past fall or this fall, because there have been times where I've mentioned earlier with all of the staff having to be quarantined and what have you, and then needing to put six or more feet between each student, it would have been wonderful to be able to have glass partitions open into other spaces so that one adult could supervise more people because we had more larger spaces to put them into with still having visibility. Not that we ever want to plan a building around a pandemic, but my goodness, it would have been handy to have some flexibility of our spaces this year. Well, and if we look for a, a silver lining behind any of this, I think it's that um, we're now uh, living through experimenting with how students can learn at their own speed, their own pace. They can do a combination of classroom learning, but independent learning. And these types of spaces will be so familiar to the students coming back from this. And they'll say, fantastic. I've now got a, a space I can do this and I can do some of my classes online. I can do some of them in the classroom. It will change the way you're able to do a lot of work with. This and I'll time. just add to Vaughn, you're so right. Last year, last year, early fall, winter, spring, trying to have these conversations with secondary teachers that that uh, flexible spaces, not all, but many, many, many were opposed to the idea of it because it was just not in the, the concept of how we've been teaching for so long. Um, but one of the things that we brought up a lot with our elementary planning and with these buildings as well is that um, safety and security in a building, and that includes, it's not just drugs and weapons, it's bullying, it's all kinds of things dramatically get reduced when you have high visibility. And so glass and visual spaces makes everything safer. It, it does. And uh, it, it follows with the same conversation it's usually from people saying with all that glass, how do you keep the classroom safe? We're not focused on locking down every single classroom. We're focused on locking down areas of a building so that we can have students deal with whatever the safety protocol is needed for that and exiting the building. So uh, we're trying to design spaces that work for the 99.999% of educational time, but still have a very strong way of securing that area in the event of an emergency. And that's exactly why uh, safety gets better, improves. Like think about when Ty implemented every teacher, every hallway, every bell at Tartan and had an entire school year without one fight. They did it without glass walls, but they had every eye on every possible space and, and problems go away when you have uh, you know better supervision. So it's Thank so you. important. Yeah, I think um, that's certainly been an interesting conversation. There's been a lot of, I think this year has been a big um, eye opener in terms of possibilities and what change can look like. So it's been a really interesting time to uh, plan a building. So um, I also wanted to mention something you said made me think of we have been um, keeping in touch with students at the high school level as we do this planning. And so we've done some listening sessions with students and I thought it was really interesting. Um, they came out pretty strong and said that they feel safer when they can see what's going on around them. That like situational awareness is really important to them. And I think that was impactful to the core planning group too, to hear it from the mouth of students, right? It's not just the pretty pictures we show them. Um, and they got to weigh in on things like, um, lockers and how do you like to access your teachers and um, you know what's your favorite part of the day and where do you like to do that type of work and so that's been a lot of fun at the high school level. Jenna's done a great job facilitating that with the principals. All right um, and uh, zoom into the uh, so that was the we've been focusing on kind of the western classroom tower expansion very same similar concepts on the northern side this happens to be the main level so we've got our business labs um, but classrooms around a flexible area access to a couple enclosed conference rooms and presence of support resources. And uh, another one of those axons. And then now we're down in science. So you can see the um, existing earth sciences classrooms proposed to remain. 
um, bio being together in these spaces as renovated renovations. And then we've got chemistry and physics co-located um, and that's kind of partially done with renovation. And then on the other side of this line would be an addition. Uh, and here's a axon of that. We actually just met for a second time last, I think it was Friday with the science department to try to figure out um, how to accommodate their varying specialized needs while also being as flexible as possible for scheduling. Uh, and then here we've got the media center floor plan. So the main entry is right here. Um, we walk right into the commons and here's that learning stair Vaughn mentioned. So there's a regular stair, but then these big tiered seating areas in that open to below. On the northern side, we've got a series of um, conference rooms or breakout spaces. Um, and then the media center has very similar concepts to it north. So a large group space um, with flexible furniture, can you be used for a presentation or small group work, reading, et cetera. Um, tech space, uh, workroom, some offices, storage, and then um, the book stacks um, still being accessible, but also securable. We've got a axon, we rotated on you a little bit here, but um, the main entrance is here. So the media center, um, we've got our area for the book stacks. Um, this is set up for a presentation, but like I said, could be a variety of things. And then you can see that open to below here with the tiered learning stair seating. So nice connectivity down to the lower level. Um, and then down, we're down on lower level. So the cafeteria commons, um, access to the kitchen and servery, and then the learning stair would be right here. Right off screen, we kind of cropped it off are the student services and student supports. And here's what that looks like. So we've got the, um, the tiered seating connecting the two levels, the kitchen and servery, and then to the north is the bulk of the seating area. Um, but the core planning groups actually, actually really like the idea of having a couple different types of places to eat so that this is the main area. Um, but if you wanted to eat over here, that's a slightly different experience, a little bit quieter. They find that due to space and the general space quality um, that many students that turn choose to eat in their car, which they're trying heavily to reduce. So that will break down that institutional feel of the cafeteria and not only give you different spaces to eat, but also provide different spaces for learning and uh, activities outside of the lunchroom hours in that common space as well. On our athletic spaces. So I went through most of this on the floor plan, but just wanted to show some relationships um, to uh, the, here's the game gym. The bleachers are shown in their extended position, but you can see we've kind of ghosted in the two courts and two courts, you have four total. Um, this is also set up for a game venue, the weights and fitness team locker rooms. And then there are some existing locker rooms just off screen. Here's a early 3D view of that. So we've got the um, the bleachers here, our four courts, team locker rooms, and then athletes can come and go from these athletic spaces out to the stadium and fields to the north. And not to speak too much for the coaches and, and your activity staff, but I would say that they're pretty excited about uh, equalizing the playing fields, no pun intended, between North and Tartan and really providing a comparable experience between both. So I apologize. I think Jenna coached us that we had 20 minutes and we like took double that and I'm really sorry, but it was a lot to share with you. So high schools thanks. are big. They're really complicated animals. So <laughs> and we love any questions. Thank you for the presentation. I mean it's really exciting to see that happening at both the schools. Um, the one thing that jumped out to me, I heard both of you, Sal and Vaughn, um, talk about the arena at Tartan. And can you please clarify that? Because we have talked and voted about decommissioning the bubble. I've heard nothing about the arena going away. And as a, a skating parent who utilizes that space, um, and I know we have a, a huge community utilization of that. So could you just, did I mishear you or no, is there something no, that we- My semantics are wrong. I apologize for that. The bubble is what's decommissioned. Okay, that. okay, so. thank you. I thought something major changed and we didn't know. And I was like, oh. Well, that's just my, my okay. not using the real language. Okay, so it is just the bubble. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, the tight site, so we got to try to maximize usability. Go ahead. Um, I'm just blown away. <laughs> so, Tartan is going to be, Tartan will no longer be round. Is that is that uh, fair to say? That is true. Okay, because I've been on the board for 20 years, and we've had more issues with Tartan in its roundness. <laughs> so I'm glad to see this awesome design and um, 
uh, it's just a, it'll be a brand new school. I'm just, I'm just floored. Yeah, it'll be wonderful. Thank you for the work. Um, the theater in Tartan, you know, Christine is a theater mom from Tartan, you know. Uh, so is the theater going to change at all? Uh, I will also say that I am a card carrying member of the International Thespian Society. Uh, okay. The, okay. the theater uh, has maintenance renovations to it. So it is um, uh, functionally works as a theater. This is uh, getting the upgrades in terms of the maintenance and the physical conditions, but the location doesn't change. Uh, probably what's most noticeable is um, a more of a connection to the common space. And that second group forum room we're looking at designing that as a black box theater. So it'll provide yet another type of performing arts space and um, practice space for theatrical production. So the theater program will be enhanced by the location of that second group forum room. Okay, okay, all right. Um, for years at Tartan Theater, they always talked about how North Theater had more, yeah. more of the high-end stuff because it's a North school, so it'll be good for them to see some of those uh, updates. We have amazing theater programs at both schools and, and yeah. definitely need to be continuing to promote that. Absolutely. Um, the other, um, I, I had one, one other comment that, and then I'll be done, but um, <clears throat> not recently, but in years past, there's been a lot of um, misinformation, I should say about pollution at Tartan in the uh, in the soil and so on. Um, can you comfort us or, or comment on uh, on the on the status of that? Well um, I know that as we start to do the excavation around the site we've been taking a lot of soil borings to understand what the um, soil conditions are. We're actually planning on replacing most of the soil around the building as part of that process as we dig it out. Um, as I mentioned before, that will also help with the stormwater management and providing appropriate drain tile and uh, water mitigation on the site as well. And so uh, we're, we're being very careful about uh, making sure that we understand what the soil conditions are. Right now, we have not found pollution in our soil borings. We found uh, soils that aren't really the best for um, structural ability, which is why we're replacing them, but it's not because they're polluted. It's really because we need to provide more of a stable footing in that area. And Vaughn and Sal, you have maybe been around for some of these rumor mill things uh, about, you know, the 3M pollution stuff started a big rumor mill. There, there's rumors flying around that Tartan was billed on a toxic waste dump and barrels are buried there, which of course it was farmland before it ever was Tartan. But the rumors are, they fly. And, and a couple of years ago, we literally had a reporter from Sydney, Australia, because they had a concern with 3M in Australia coming to our, our Relay for Life cancer fundraiser to get parents to tell them why they thought Tartan was, you know, and so we pulled all kinds of data from Washington County records and health records. And I personally pulled data at what are, you know, cancer rates and all that. It's so made up, but the rumor mill, once it gets started, is hard to stop. No, it, it, we, have, it, we have not it, found buried caches of, <laughs> of toxic waste. You have it. Not, no. <laughs> Well, it, I mean, it is true. It, there's some lingering talk about that kind of thing still, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so the more we can do to assure people that... Uh, and it seems like of the pollutants that did, you know, pass on, kind of went downstream a little bit more towards Woodbury and Cottage Grove, really, than... And certainly there's no... Certainly not anything on the Tartan land at all, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this uh, project will give people an opportunity to... Um, breathe a sigh of relief and say, I'm sure it would have been taken care of as part of that construction, if there wasn't. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, good. Very exciting, thank you. Thank you. I got a question about stacks. Um, is there um, kind of like data saying that um, kids are not checking out books um, at schools or using books at schools anymore? Are they in the teacher's classrooms or are they going to like a public library or a university library? Um, I think the space that you're making for Stacks looks really cool and really inviting. And it also gives it like the secretive, like uh, kind of like we can lock up our secret books kind of situation there too. I'm kind of being nerdy by saying that, but um, I'm a library nerd. But is there like data that's saying like, 
um, you know, one, we have to use the media center as a media center, being that it, it can be used for any type of media. Um, so we have to kind of quadrant off the books a little bit more. Um, but our teacher is going to have space for our teachers using um, their rooms to add books or have book spaces um, or kids going off site to get their books. Um, any is there any like general thought about that or I or, or um, best practices you have about putting together stacks? I was going to, maybe I'll jump in on a couple of those. I might have to tap Jenna too, but um, I think the core planning groups were both very excited about the idea that the media center is um, books and. I don't think anybody sees books not being a critical part of a student's experience, especially learning to do research. And um, but and I know your, um, your teams that manage those spaces work really carefully to, I'm going to call it curate their collection so that it's relevant to students. So they check how often things have been um, checked out and you know, do we have a good balance? Um, so they have helped us um, figure out the right number of volumes to plan around. And it's it's a pretty significant number. So um, I think the I'd call it anecdotal data from your own district is that that's still of incredibly high value. Um, although I would say in general, the amount of square footage in a media center that's dedicated to just books, we are seeing as a trend in going down, whether that's more creative storage um, or just a general collection um, reduction so that there is more um, flexible learning area. Um, we have heard a little bit about teachers um, uh, accessing those books. There's been big topics. It sounds maybe silly, but like, where do we store the textbooks? Should that be in the media center? Should that be in each department? So there's been a little bit of back and forth on that. Um, or uh, Caitlin, have you heard anything more about teacher, teacher individual libraries? Um, I think each teacher has, you know, a very small library in their room, but um, it hasn't sounded like, you know, we're, we're starting user groups, but it hasn't sounded like they're planning on growing by any means. So. I think I would just add too. I mean, just being through this process now with elementary to middle to high school, you know, definitely, I think elementary, you know, we, we really had to have a lot of conversations about classroom libraries at the elementary level as they tend to have a lot of books in their classrooms. And as kids are accessing and more and more comfortable with digital formats too, I think that's why you probably see a, a bit less at the high school level, but still, like Sal mentioned, there's still very much a commitment to having some books and making sure kids have access to good literature and, and information. I think, I think your point too of the media center changing, um, we sometimes say that it's uh, less about media retrieval and as much about media creation these days and uh, really providing students the opportunity to explore how they can uh, get into multimedia research as well as um, presentation with any of the things they're working on is very important for this area. Um, I was going to say uh, thank you to you guys for the presentation and for your work on this. I think it's clear that a strength from you guys is your creative ability to um, find ways of adding that flexible space. So I think the flexible spaces just make the schools look so much more modern and um, also the kind of schools that people want to learn in today and people want to teach in. So Thank you for your work on that. Um, I know you mentioned the secure entries and I know one of our priorities in the um, um, facilities was the security of the buildings. So I wonder if you can say any more about the security of the buildings. And just one more thing is I have kids who go to North and I'm curious about the Wi-Fi at both the buildings. Wi-Fi, okay, maybe let's talk security first. Um, so um, Vaughn kind of mentioned it, but the, um, what we're working to do is make sure that the building has um, appropriate security zones. So obviously the addition of the secure vestibule is one, one level of zone. Um, they're a little bit hard to see in here, so I might kind of draw on top, but um, then working with the um, building administration to try to find um, key areas to be able to lock off an entire wing of a building. Um, so being able to lock off the media center and then the access to the academic wing here. Um, and then there are multiple ways out of that particular security zone once you're inside of it. And then there are a couple other ones. I think there's some existing ones 
like here and here. Um, so taking advantage of cross corridor doors to make sure that um, we can contain that space and they have multiple ways out in each. So that's really true on all three levels. Um, it looks a little bit different at Tartan, but same philosophy so that the classroom wing to the north and the classrooms and um, exploratories to the south can be secured um, and make sure that they have multiple ways out. Um, which really allow is what allows um, for the additional visibility at the classroom level. Um, so you don't have to have the lockdown line at the classroom wall. It can be in our pod or zone. The new addition um, will have a security zone there as we will be required to with the, um, the storm shelter. Um, I don't know, Caitlin, did I miss any lockdown lines here? Um, no, I think the only thing that's a little bit different is the lockdown zone would be at the north side of the media center so that um, at both schools, they were hoping to push that lockdown line back further so that the community really could use the media center after hours sure. um, and still have not have access to the classroom wing. So that was something that was um, locked right here, right? Yep. You have this stuff open at night. Correct. It was important to be able to allow the school to be used for the community um, purposes. Um, and then Wi-Fi, I think we'll have to, um, I know it's been something that's been explored at other projects. I assume you guys have a, you'd struggle with access. Is that your uh, implication? I know Josh and team have already been talking about Wi-Fi and, and ways to improve that. So I think, I know their, their team's all over that. We, sure. we probably have a future meeting, like a technology yeah, coming sure. up where we would hear that, so. Michelle, do you have a specific question about Wi-Fi that we can answer? Oh, no, just in the past, we've had Wi-Fi issues and my understanding was it had something to do with the building itself. Um, so I wondered when they remodel the buildings, if they, um, you know, think about Wi-Fi in the way they build it. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be looking to make sure that we have, you know, up, the high schools right now have um, the most up-to-date access points right now in the building, but we'll definitely be adding more as they go through the renovations. Good question. All right, anything else for the Wold team? I just wanted to make sure to um, thank the participants of the core planning groups. They dedicated a lot of time to help us develop this to what it is. Um, and then we're kind of in the heat of the user group process, but to all those teachers and staff that are um, giving their time, sharing their opinions so that these serve them well long into the future, we're, we're really appreciative of that. I will thank them in advance. We know that the upcoming user groups, they're time intensive. Uh, we ask a lot of the staff to help us understand how they want to use the space, but it's a great opportunity for them to provide that input. And I know they're dealing with lots of other things right now, but um, hopefully this extra time now makes these buildings work well into the future for you. Uh, great, thank you. And we thank the planning teams as well. And we thank you guys and thanks for the presentation. Any other comments, questions before we move to the next agenda item? Michelle, um, I was just uh, curious, I, my question is for Wald, but um, what, what's our current capacity at Tartan right now? And uh, what are we thinking it probably will be after we do the renovation? The end goal is 1,800 total students. Um, Caitlin, do you happen to remember off the top of your head? We're going, um, we're going up. It's not hundreds and hundreds of additional. I, I want to say, if I remember correctly, from when we were doing the programming, that uh, it's comfortably around 16, 1650, and depending on which spaces you count, it pushes it up from there, which is why it's felt like it's a little bit tight in there. And so as we expand out to get to that 1800 and with the flexible learning areas, it should feel a lot more comfortable in the building. Okay, thank you so much. Well, thanks for all your time tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. See you soon. Thank you. All right, our next agenda item is policy revisions. <laughs> 
All right, Not that's true. me. That's me. Okay. Um, I'm just going to jump through these really quickly. Uh, I know you all have copies in board book. I can certainly pull them up if you want to see them. These are all um, pretty uh, basic changes. The um, There's three policies that are up for revision and we've got a lot fewer this year from MSBA than usual. The first is policy 419, tobacco-free environment, possession and use of tobacco, tobacco-related devices and electronic delivery. This basically um, includes some new requirements to add vaping awareness and prevention instructions um, and update some definitions. And that's, that's again, an MSBA model policy. So there's a, it's just some real uh, updates. Most of these are just updates to uh, state statute language that has changed. The second one is student medication. I'll just mention the three and then we can, if you have questions. This basically just, again, is an MSBA model recommendation. It adds provisions regarding a storage and return of drugs and medication or regarding a, a abandoned or uh, unclaimed prescription drugs. There's just an extra statement. Again, a new requirement to include in our policy. And then the last one um, regarding school district curriculum and instruction goals adds some new statutory language related to dyslexia screening. So um, they're all pretty minor changes, but they're all um, current required updates to our, our policies. And you all have them, of course, in board book to look at in, in depth if you want to, but they're they're fairly minor changes, to be honest. Any questions? Again, this is just our first look at them. We have three official readings before we finalize any policy. So if something does come up for you, you can always let us know. But like I said, these are all pretty really minor changes. All right, thanks, Christine. Um, any questions or comments on those? Um, can we move on to the next agenda item? Yeah. Okay, the next agenda item is board officer committee and MSBA board discussion. So we had um, gone through this October 6th work study session. And I feel like we had a lot of, um, I mean, we got through everything, I think. Um, we're going to talk about it today and then it looks like we'll also talk about it one more time, which is December 8th work study session. Um, for For the board preference sheet. Um, we have advisory committee um, and the advisory committee position is becoming available when Ben transitions off. And unfortunately, Carla was not reelected to the, Carly was not reelected to the board. Um, so we need to have somebody fill in there. Um, so is somebody interested in that advisory committee? Hey, this is Ben again. Um, I know this sort of breaks what what we were saying last time, having the yearly rotation off. But if like nobody really wants to do it, um, it's been fairly pleasant working with that group this year so far. So, <laughs> you know, if it comes down to it and nobody wants to go for it, I'll I'll be there to to do it. So. Throwing that out there. I'd like to add that, you know, once COVID's over, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for us to continue to use Zoom as a platform. I think attendance is so much higher at certain meetings when we do use Zoom and people can jump on mm -hmm. from home and not have to get in their car on a snowy mm -hmm. night and drive there. And I, I would strongly encourage us to do so. I'd also like to point out that Carly is still a parent in our district and could join that group as a parent, if you so liked as well, Carly, and we would certainly love to have your 
your participation if that is something you're still interested in as well. I think Carly, honestly, your experience being a parent in the district and also being a teacher in another district gives you some real insight and, and opportunity and experiences that would really be welcome. So just have to emphasize that. So we don't Absolutely. have to take her off. She just wouldn't be the board rep, but she could still be there. I would love to participate. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, do we have any other volunteers for the advisory or we can um, continue with Ben in that role? All right, Ben. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. We really appreciate you. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, then, Unless there's other things that you guys want to talk about through this preference sheet, I'm just going to skip to the ones that we still need to address. Um, so it would be the welcome back barbecue. Um, I know Becky said that she would be available to help out. Um, is there a board member who would be willing to lead that? I could also put in there that, you know, we could also designate uh, an employee in the district to be a person who's a key liaison for that. Uh, I don't. I don't think that's a terrible idea. I love that the board is so helpful in hosting and preparing. But, um, you know, when you think about different kinds of commitments, um, we certainly will always back that up with internal support and, and could, uh, you know, even augment that as needed. If somebody wanted to be a point person, but not have to do, like the way that Becky ran that and the way that Amy's run it is heavy, heavy lifting. And I wouldn't be opposed to us finding internal staff to help do that. And then the board members are um, kind of point people for the board, but they don't have to necessarily do quite the heavy lifting that, that has happened in the past. Okay, if it's okay, then I'll volunteer to do it and I will work with Christine or Kim. And, and you can next next August, August you can next August Michelle you can pull up this recording and remind me that I said that <laughs> just kidding that's right I will <laughs> gotcha uh, that would be okay. great because to be perfectly honest I do think that um, you know there's a lot of internal capacity to do some of that work and uh, you know and we could certainly have some folks do that while they're in their other jobs too okay, great and Michelle um, the next one yes. Um, for for this committee and any other committees where uh, we might have open spots, uh, we do have two board members joining us uh, in January. So uh, I, I, we could always add them later on if they were to express interest come January, February, I presume, right? They would just take a board vote. That's a really good point because we could, you know, they could be added to these things or take your place in a role if need be as well, if they're interested. Okay. All right, the next one we should look at is Ramsey County League of Local Governor Governments. Um, Caleb is an alternative, or sorry, is an alternate. And you, Caleb's also rotating off, right, Caleb? I mean, you were rotating off, but then became an alternate. So would you want to stay on or does somebody else want to step in? I can stay on unless someone is uh, really enthusiastic about it. Looks like you get to stay on, Caleb. All right. Okay, thanks. Um, any other ones? Okay. So anything else that we want to talk about related to committees? 
no. If not, we did talk about board officers and we did have people express interest in the different um, positions. Kim, I don't think that I can see anything where that's listed though. Can I in board book right now? There's, there's just one sheet that shows current board history. And just to refresh everyone's memory, it, it last time that you discussed this, we had Michelle was encouraged to stay on as chair, Nancy as vice chair, Ben was interested in the clerk position and Caleb would uh, stay on as treasurer. So that's kind of where we left off. Okay, thanks. Um, so do we have any further discussion on any of those roles? Okay, if not, then again, um, as it states in board book, we're gonna talk about this one last time on December 8th um, before we take action in January. Okay, so our next agenda item, again, last chance, anything else on that one? Okay, our next agenda item is our board check-in. So, um, Caleb, do you want to start us off with board check-in? Um, I don't have anything tonight. All right, thanks. Um, Becky? Nothing tonight. Okay, Carly? Um, yeah, I'm so glad because I was just getting ready to send a message in the chat to say it's been a pleasure um, and I'm going to rock it out, rock it out to December with you guys. Um, I do think that everything happens for a reason. And I definitely um, enjoyed working with each and every one of you and will continue to do that through, I think over the years, because <laughs> um, like Christine said, I'm, a, I'm yes. a parent. Yes, I'm a parent. I'm not going anywhere. And the goal was met. I filled in until some people stepped up. That was our initial um, agreement, you know, when I agreed to be on the board. And look, look what happened. More people stepped up and, and it's a diverse, um, situation here and that was something else we wanted so i'm a proud parent you know and you guys now you know you can call me when you need me so <laughs> each and every last one of you it's a project you need a parent survey whatever i'm here and i'm just honored and really glad to have met each and everyone and then got involved in the community like the way i wanted to um that was my main goal so i just wanted to say that because i was going to put it in the chat but now i can just say it <laughs> So yeah, it's been it's been a great experience. You know, Carly, in two years is when the the seats open up again. Mm -hmm. So you certainly have more opportunities to be back mm -hmm. participating this way. Yeah. Thanks, Becky. Yep. Carly, we'll miss you and and yes, hang in there and in two years expect to see your name on the ballot once again. Yep. Thanks, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Unless we hire her first. <laughs> That's yeah. always a possibility. Hey, who knows what will happen? I'm, I'm definitely um, working on some things behind the scenes. I'm working really hard. And um, that, that's coming to a closure. So we'll see. <laughs> Christine, are, I may be call, I may be doors, using you. <laughs> doors will continue to open. I have absolutely no doubt. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, thanks, Carly. Uh, Nancy, did you have anything? We can't hear you. No, I don't. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, ben? Uh, really crushed to see you go, Carly. Uh, it was really excellent working with you. And uh, like everyone's saying, um, I hope you're on the ballot in two years. Um, yeah, crushed. Um, I was gonna, I just have two things. Uh, one, the, um, there's an auction and Christine, you really have to help me with this because I'm not totally with it. Um, as far as this goes, there's an auction for, um, uh, the taste of 622. Um, it's something that we do every year and, uh, 
Tartan usually hosts um, an auction and a chance to taste a bunch of different foods from around the community. Um, I believe the food portion is obviously called off for this year, but there's still going to be an online auction. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, anyone on the call here or on, anyone on the Zoom um, and anyone you know, just let them know about the auction. And I believe, um, just talk to me if you have any questions about it. I believe the information's out there. And Christine, you can you? I'll just add to it. It's so it's our six, uh, annual 622 Education Foundation auction. I just put the link here in the chat. But um, this is an auction that typically is silent auction baskets often happens in person at the Taste of 622, which the foundation typically hosts at Tartan High School uh, on a on a Saturday morning. And this year it's going virtual. And Ben is so humble to not mention his beautiful wife, Carrie Netto, who has helped put this entire auction online, much like she did back in the day for Cowern years ago, their silent auction. She moved that online and found that they got a lot more uh, traffic and a lot more um, bidding happening by putting it online. So I have a feeling that this is going to be something that's going to continue online, even once we have the taste of 622 back in person. And I just want to put a huge shout out to Pam Huntley. Doug and Pam Huntley are our parents in our district who are on the foundation board. And every single day, Pam comes into our office to photograph those baskets and put them out there. And all that money goes directly back to servicing our 622 students. It is a separate organization, a separate nonprofit, but much like our local, our, our local parent organizations in our schools, um, they, they put everything back into our schools and our students and families in need. So shout out to Carrie for helping so much help this foundation that was struggling a little bit this year and, and to the, the crew that's doing a lot of work. We've had more participation online than we have had even when we did it in person. So pretty cool. Cool. Thanks for having my back there, Christine. Yes. And that link that's there is actually the auction doesn't go live until Friday morning, but the, you can start to preview what's coming up. Uh, one other thing too. Uh, I uh, Thanks for... Um, Kim, you sent out some emails about our meeting on Thursday. Uh, I know we need we need to uh, bring our bag and our folders. Um, is there anything else we should um, prepare ourselves for? Uh, like anything we can prep for ahead of time besides checking out board book or anything like that? And if not, it's cool. Just checking to make sure. Okay, cool. Thanks. No need to bring yourself and uh, it will be in person. So I'm glad you reminded us of that, Ben. Sure. It Thanks will a be lot. In person and um, um, Sharice will be facilitating once again. This is the second half of our board retreat that we didn't quite finish last time. So awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ben. Steve, do you have anything? Nothing tonight. Okay. I have two quick things. One is just that um, I'm the rep for 916. Um, and I know there's various levels of familiarity on our board with what 916 is. Um, reach out to me if you want to learn more about it. But um, 916 has announced that all their uh, schools are going all distance as well. So just so you know that. Um, and then the other one is that Christine actually asked me to talk about our February 20th retreat. Um, our February 20th retreat is a Saturday and it's the weekend of, um, actually the 20th would be the date that we would consider switching it to. I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah, February the, thir 13th. the 13th is the original date. Yeah, so that one is over President's Day weekend, so we might want to consider moving it to the, um, pushing it out a week to the February 20th date, if that works for everyone. Uh, you know, it's a Saturday one week later. Um, maybe we can check our calendars and email Kim. <laughs> How about email Kim if you have a conflict with that date, and if we don't hear from you, we're going to assume it works? That sounds okay. good. And then we can put it on the board agenda for the November 24th business meeting to make that change. Sounds good. 
yeah, we, either way, we, we need to get that. We just want to get the date out there because our, our newest elected board members are going to want to get the date on their calendar as well. And so finalizing that as soon as possible would be great. I just thought with some with some folks with the three day weekend, some people might, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe COVID's lighter and you want to visit family or something. Okay, and then we're our next meeting is Thursday to canvas the election and then our retreat. So in two days, we'll see each other again. Um, anything else? Okay, then I don't need a motion to adjourn a study session, right, Kim? <laughs> That's right. We can just call the time and adjourn the meeting. All right. Thanks, you guys. Have a good night. Stay this safe, everyone. Have a good night, everyone.